is a subset of the general problem of cyber attacks and internet security. It is a subset of our general theme today. It is a much more complicated task because it involves immediately issues of free speech. And one person's troll is another person's activist. These are complicated problems, but we, the panel wants to focus, or I hope the panel will focus, on the issue of solutions. For some time, the West has been, if I may say, admiring the problem of disinformation in general and Russian disinformation in particular. In my own country, the United States, we realized the extent and strength of Russian disinformation late in the course of the 2016 presidential campaign. And some of our colleagues from Europe, Ukraine, Estonia, in Poland in particular, asked us, what took us so long? America tends to often arrive late at an issue, but with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. So let us hope it is so in this case. We want to focus on the problem of disinformation in general, and in my own country, the energy created by the fact of Russian interference in our elections, and the extensive and ongoing Russian use of disinformation, has given this issue political energy, which hopefully people in the United States can turn into sound public policy. So we hope to have a lively discussion. I will admit my bias as a former policymaker is to find solutions. Academics will look at a glass and they will say that glass is half empty, that glass is cracked, the water is flowing out, and if you touch that glass, it will fall apart. So you might as well just give up. A policymaker such as myself looks at that same glass and says, well, it may have some cracks, but I can use some duct tape and wire and hold it together, set up a drip system to get the water back in. I can work with this glass, which is the problem of policymakers we tend to think we can work with anything. And sometimes it isn't true. But nevertheless, that is my instinct. So, with that, um, do we have a volunteer to start off from the panel? Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for having me. It's a deeply an honor to be able to speak in front of such a distinguished um, audience. Before we tackle the um, problem and before we are about to find solutions, we need to uh, identify what it is exactly. Because this information is a tool, it can be used by different entities in different contexts. But in the context that you have already mentioned, the Russian influence operation, this is a single tool that, belo tool that belongs to the toolbox. And this toolbox for a couple of decades is called active measures. In Polish it would be środki aktywne. And active measures is a unique Russian umbrella term for Russian influence operations. So be aware that apart from this information, they are using other tactics such as front organizations, forgeries, agents of influence, and all of it works uh, as an orchestra, as a classical mechanical watch. So in order to understand why the given hour is displayed on the clock, you need to see in motion certain gears and wheels, how, carry, how they interact each other. So we need to understand that this kind of influence operations that are hurting Western democracy so much are part of the broader strategy 
employed by Russia. It's not an ad hoc activity. It's a state-organized, permanent influence operation. It's a matter of policy, and it hasn't started a couple of years ago. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's not that difficult to, to get back to the you know, Tsars and the Ukraine, but I won't do that. But what I'd like to say is that uh, influence operations are deeply embedded into Russian statecraft. And we should be quite uh, careful while naming Russian phenomena with Western terms, simply because Western terms, uh, I personally believe that they are not a very good fit. Uh, so we know the tool, we know toolbox, uh, we know the context how the toolbox is used, so we need to understand who is using the toolbox and using what mindset. And the general answer Russia, it is not enough, because it does not meet the requirement of the no-die enemy. We have to really pinpoint who is making decisions, who is coordinating this, and with what mindset. And it's, uh, in terms of history and theory, it's quite well documented that most of it comes from the Russian intelligence apparatus. And we need to keep that in mind. And I don't mean institutions of Russian intelligence or law enforcement forces. We know that the influence of uh, such entities uh, are much bigger than just institutions. Just look at the uh, highest positions in the Russian state. Uh, one more thing I, I'd like to mention is uh, the fact that Russia are not separating methods as for new ones and old ones. They rather see at the, seeing methods in the light of effective and ineffective. Why is that? Because of the human nature. Human nature is relatively stable in the unstable world, then that's why they can employ mechanism, social mechanism, cultural mechanism that, they, that existed thousands of years ago. I'd like to just touch upon, but we will discuss it later during the panel, I hope, the evolving nature of active measures. Don't think of, as of this information as a you know, 100 years old technique that it's not changing. It's ever changing because of the channel of the delivering information is changing. Actually, in terms of cyber realm, as we all know, is offering um, uh, great benefit for the, for the offense. So, what is really important it is, frankly, this is why I don't like the term fake news, because it concentrates you on the news. So it's, it's, a, it's a piece of information that is designed to lead you to the wrong beliefs, or some might add, to the wrong decisions. They are inter deeply interested in influencing the previous process so it's not about the news, it's, it's about how you are thinking about the news. So they do not quite care so much about what you think in the long term. In the long term, they are thinking, they are thinking about how you think, how to influence your, uh, your, what you think is true, your methodology, your autonomous analytical process. So, in a way, to create the way how you think, and that's, that's the way how they can, they can control your results. So, to put, put it uh, bluntly, they don't want to tie your hands, they want to convince you that you don't need to use those hands. And it's always been the case uh, in, in terms of, you know, Russia-Western relationship, because Russia is not stronger than United West. It's a GDP of roughly equivalent of Texas. So that's why they are using this. So they are tempering with the analytical process, the conceptual um, uh, frameworks. And, and the, in 1992, double digit percent of Americans believed that AIDS had been created by the CIA, double digits. It's, as you know, or maybe you don't know, there was an Operation Infection 
uh, wholly de designed by the KGB in order to convince Americans that AIDS was created and fought Derek to, to against uh, Afro-Americans. But this is the long span, the long, uh, the long perspective of Russian influence uh, operation. I will be happy to uh, share with you how I, I see uh, uh, the way to thwart these kinds of threats. But it's, this is the general background. Please keep in mind it's about how you think, it's about broad aspect of tools, just tools. It can be used by different entities. What Russia has actually is a very good coordination in this and uh, well, they're very bold with this. So in many ways they're not uh, afraid of being uh, debunked later on because due to technology they can, while we are debunking one story, they already, they've already created three and other they're, they're running with the ball. That would be my introductory remarks. Thank you, Ambassador. I want to express profound agreement and also regret because I wanted to use the story of how the KGB started <laughs> the, um, the, the story that the CIA invented AIDS and you beat me to it. Sorry. But let me try, let me try another, a, a broader reflection building on what you just said because I agree with it profoundly. The Russians do not invent, invent but they exploit the existing divisions in our countries. And I want to be quite specific about this. Condi Rice used to say that America's birth defect was slavery. And the racism that came out of slavery is an enduring crack in American society. The Russians play at that division. They take both sides. What they do with us, they do in Great Britain, they do in Spain. They didn't invent Catalonian nationalism, but they exploit it. They didn't invent the National Front in France, but they go, but they support it. They do the same thing, I suspect, they do the same thing in Poland, playing both sides of various issues. And they do it deliberately because they want to weaken us. Now this is not, I don't think I've told anybody in this room something, anything you don't already know, but I wanted to mention this specifically to Russian disinformation because it is not a general problem, well, it is a problem in general, but it is being used specifically by the Russians right now against us all. Um, Jakub, you worked for a long time in the EU on these issues. You're now in Prague, um, continuing to work on these issues and with the Atlantic Council. What do you want to recommend for our common steps to combat the problem? Thank you very much for the introduction and, and thank you very much for the question. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you are asking me that. Um, I actually wanted to start with a bit of polemics uh, about the name of the panel, you know, the disinformation on social media. And, and it actually answers also a bit to your question, like what, what steps I would like to see. It seems to me that too often we limit the discussion to either social media or a different tool. The trouble is that this really distorts the nature of the problem. Social media are just, mm, just a tool, just a producer. They are not the producer, they are not the organizer of the disinformation campaign. They are just a tool that's being used. And they are even not the only tool. Uh, we have so many other tools. Uh, mm, last year we had uh, presidential elections in Czech Republic. Probably the chain emails were much more important. Uh, they could reach hundreds of thousands of people every single day. Uh, several thousands of these emails were, were sent out and the vote was decided by some 70,000 votes. So they probably had a much, much more impact than, for example, uh, Twitter accounts, which are, which are really uh, read in, in lower digits uh, in Czech Republic. And this focusing on tools, I'm pretty sure that Kremlin is very happy about it. It's almost like, you know, I have a cat. <laughs> uh, I have these toys, I, I, I play with her. Uh, you know, you, you have this feather, she, she plays with the feather. You show her the laser light, she plays with the laser light. At, at one point, she arrives to the state when, when she stops looking at the feather and she looks at the hand. Oh, it's actually not the feather that's moving, it's the hand moving it. 
why haven't we arrived to this stage yet? I mean, we are still looking at, you know, they manipulate Facebook, so we start looking into Facebook. Uh, they use deepfakes, we start looking into deepfakes. They use chain emails, we look at chain emails. Maybe we should look at the aggressor. <laughs> um, and this actually brings me to, we can't just keep talking about repairing our weaknesses without discussing that we have the aggressor who is exploiting our weaknesses. We wouldn't be solving the trouble of a mass shooter with buying many bulletproof vests. We wouldn't be solving the problem of an arsonist in a village uh, by training more firemen. We have to arrest the arsonist, we have to arrest the mass shooter. Um, the trouble is that if you really focus only on repairing the weaknesses, the aggressor will always find new ones, and we see that the Kremlin is really doing it. We have seen they have tried opening uh, Sputnik offices in uh, Scandinavia, in all four countries. Uh, they were extremely unsuccessful, so they had to shut down the Sputnik offices there. That doesn't mean they would abandon uh, the information space in Sweden or Norway or Finland. They just refocused on social media trolling, the worst example of pro-Kremlin trolling we know about in the whole European Union is in Finland. The Finnish journalist Jessica Aro, who was bullied for several months or even years. Um, they focused on uh, manipulating the discussions under established media outlets, which is a technique they use in other countries as well, but it was more important for them in Scandinavia. Um, they can use a tool um, of uh, Russian state TV in Estonia or Latvia, where there is a huge Russian-speaking minority. You couldn't use this tool in um, France, in Czech Republic. Uh, as actually Bruce Schneider was mentioning it, uh, the attackers are adapting to how we defend. And if you only keep defending, they will simply keep finding new weaknesses. We really have to arrive to the point where we say we, we will stop the aggressor. Um, the trouble also is that if we don't do that, we encourage other aggressors to use the same tools, and we actually see it happening. We see that Iran uh, or Venezuela are using the same disinformation techniques as Russia. And I'm fairly sure that it is a bit caused by our weak reaction. We have shown we do not react to, to this kind of aggression. Um, I know you like what, what the EU is doing in this regard, so, so uh, let me say that I also have a huge respect in what the US is doing in this regard. Uh, the US is investigating the information manipulation before the uh, 2016 presidential elections. Show me a single European country that would do something similar. We still do not have proper investigation into what happened before the French presidential elections last year, uh, or actually already 2017, uh, German parliamentary elections, Czech presidential elections, Austrian presidential elections. We still have no investigation into what happened, actually. So we are basically saying, we don't mind, you can attack our democracies and we won't do anything. <laughs> um, the recommendations. Many, many papers have already been written about it. Uh, I think the first recommendations I was reading about in the, uh, the English-speaking world were written by Peter Pomerantsev and Michael Weiss in 2014. Uh, you have co-authored a paper uh, last year, Democratic Defense um, Against Disinformation. I think we have the recommendations and I think what we need to do, we just, uh, we just simply need a political decision to actually start doing it. Too often, I have seen the debates looking for like 100% bulletproof solution that will solve every, every single problem. There is none like that. <laughs> and too often you would see that if the discussions do not have the outcome of this 100% solution, uh, then the decision makers decide it's better not to do anything. No, it would still be worth starting with a solution that will solve at least 20% of the problem, because then we will have a smaller problem. <laughs> Please start at least with something. So in the EU, you would see uh, the unit where, where I used to work, uh, which is focused on raising the awareness, the EU versus disinfo campaign, uh, about the new action plan, which was um, agreed by the heads of state in December. You still do not see much of implementation there. So uh, if the situation hasn't moved in, in uh, two months, uh, I, I worry whether they will manage to implement anything before the May elections in the European Parliament, and to be frank, I'm, I'm quite um, worried about, about the possible outcome of the European elections. Um, so, now, <laughs> the, the, the main point I, I actually wanted to make, uh, that yes, we, we know that we have to educate the uh, 
citizens, we have, to, uh, we have to educate the civil servants, we have to educate also the politicians. We know how we have to force the social media to cooperate on this problem a bit more. Uh, we know we have to support the journalists who are uncovering many of the uh, malicious activities of the Russian Federation. But I think one of the most crucial decisions we have to make is, uh, do we actually want to stop Russia or not? And once we have yes as an answer, then it will actually come to us. The solutions will appear. Uh, once we have the strategy, we have to stop Russia's aggression. Um, we will know what to do. Jakub, thank you for that. Um, for the record, the United States did sanction, you've imposed financial sanctions against the Internet um, Research Agency, the St. Petersburg Troll Farm, and at the very, very end of the Obama administration, we imposed sanctions on Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Kremlin, so-called Kremlin caterer who has sideline hobbies, including being a conduit for the Wagner Brigade, the Russian Mercenary Brigade in Syria, and also a conduit for Kremlin funds to the Internet Research Agency. Um, we could have done, we, the United States in this case, could, probably should be doing more. I wish the European Union were doing more um, to go after the targets, and that's one of Jakub's suggestions. But I, I don't know that I agree that defensive measures are useless. I rather agree with your point that a 20% solution is 20%... Mo 20 hitting 20% 20 of the problem is not bad. But since you mentioned the paper that Alina and I co-wrote um, last year, which tried to outline solutions, a paper which is now sufficiently out of date that we're trying to do a second edition, I want to ask Alina to to outline some of, some of the thinking in that paper and some of your own thinking about the practicality of defensive measures, what it looks like, um, and, and what, are, what are the different roles for the different actors? What should governments do? What about social media companies? Um, what about civil society groups? And how do they work together? I mean, we'll frame up the solution for us in addition to Jakub's um, laudable aggression of going after you know, the instigators of uh, you know, the, the instigators of disinformation, of which I thoroughly approve. But I want to take all the possibilities and sort of all get them all out there. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Uh that could be a one hour long lecture, but I will try to summarize in about five to eight minutes. Um, as we say in our paper, as, as you well know, and which also echoes some of the comments that have already been made on this panel, is that there is no silver bullet, which is what Jakob was pointing to. There's no blanket solution to this problem. And that's exactly because this is multi-vectored and multi-layered uh, style of political warfare that state actors like Russia, but many others now are in this game as well, have unleashed against Western democracies. And I think the point that uh, we try to make in the paper and continue to uh, restate every time we have these discussions is that the response cannot be authoritarian in nature, meaning we have to respond in a democratic way, in a way that is rooted in our principles and ideals and doesn't infringe on democratic values like free speech, uh, first and foremost, and other freedoms that we value. Because as you say, Ambassador, very often, uh, we don't, ha we shouldn't become them to beat them, right? And so I wanna take a quick step back um, because I do think that it's important to also agree in what we're talking about. You know, we, there's a lot of terms that get thrown around when we have these conversations. We talk about disinformation, we talk about information manipulation, talk about fake news, uh, talk about misinformation, and often in the media, these are all used interchangeably, and they're not. You know, fake news, I completely agree, is not a term I would ever use in a discussion about this issue, mainly because it has become a term for news I don't like, basically. And it doesn't tell us anything about the intent behind that kind of uh, inaccurate information. And it's not always news focused, as we saw in the US elections and various other elections, like the French elections and 
just in general, this content is often not political. And it's not even news-based. Um, it's just content that's meant to amplify existing divisions, as, as you were also saying. I think the term that is most appropriate is disinformation, because that means it's the ma malicious and intentional spread of inaccurate information. Misinformation is just inaccurate information. All of us have probably made the error of stating a fact incorrectly, unintentionally, or sharing a story that later we found out wasn't completely real or completely accurate. That's normal, that's part of just a learning process. Disinformation, of course, is a strategy. Um, it's a strategy launched by Russia and others to try to manipulate and influence our politics and our societies. And the other piece that I think is important to keep in mind is that it is disinformation we're talking about here is sometimes linked to cyber attacks, but usually it is not. So again, we saw this in the US elections where we had these uh, data hacks and dumps. So the, uh, the theft of various emails of the Democratic National Convention, of the Hillary Clinton campaign, we saw this in the so-called Macron leaks uh, campaign during the French elections and elsewhere. And then that information got spun into a disinformation campaign. So sometimes these are linked, but most of the time they are not. So we're not seeing these big uh, data dump and uh, spins more recently. What we're seeing now is what I would call you know, quite traditional, uh, not, not very sophisticated uh, spread of disinformation by state actors across Russia, but not just Russia. And that brings me to the second point, which is that we do need to be I think quite sober about parsing out the, what is the Russian threat here or the foreign actor threat and what is an organic problem in our societies. And in fact, if we look at everything the Russians have done, and again, think, thanks to the special counsel investigation in the United States, we know a lot of detail about how these operations have worked, but we see that they, they weren't innovators. They weren't very sophisticated they basically used the existing tools that are already out there, tools that are in fact used by marketers and other firms, corporations, to try to reach their target audience. So the same tools you could, you know, Nike, for example, could use to sell sneakers to young men in the suburbs of Michigan between the ages of 16 and 19 who bought Adidas sneakers in the last two months. Those are exactly the same kinds of tools that you can use for a political manipulation campaign. And so my point here is that the Russians may have alerted us to this problem, and actually we should be thankful for, to them for this, because we now see that this playbook is diffusing, and there's a certain amount of learning happening between authoritarian states. So one example, um, during the Skripal uh, po poisoning attempt in the UK, I don't know how many fake stories or disinformation uh, content the Russians tried to spread. Um, I, I lost count at about 33 different stories. So completely different stories trying to muddy the water as to what the objective reality is. Now imagine a situation that we're quickly approaching where it's not just 30 stories from Russia, it's, it's 50 stories from China, it's 70 stories from Iran, and the list could go on. And in addition to that, we now have had examples of domestic actors in our society using this exact same playbook to try to win certain political uh, tact, tactful uh, wins. So very recently, we were talking about uh, this example that I don't know if all of you have heard about, but uh, it happened in the United States, and there's been a lot of reporting on it in the last few weeks, where a private firm uh, called New Knowledge, which has been very well received in doing some of the analysis around disinformation from Russia. They even were uh, contracted out by the Senate Intelligence Committee to write a major report on the IRA. Well, this same firm um, actually used the same techniques that the Russian used to try to shift the elections and the special senatorial elections in Alabama last year. Uh, they received money from a liberal donor who claims he, that he didn't know this company was doing this. And what they did is they set up f fake Russian accounts, so fake Russian trolls, fake Russian bots, uh, to make it seem like the Russians were supporting the Republican candidate. 
and then to also make it seem like that candidate was advocating for an alcohol ban, which in the American South will lose you an election <laughs> if you try to ban alcohol. So what we're seeing is these kinds of techniques being used by domestic actors as well. And so to get to the solutions, which I know is where we're heading, um, there is very much a clear role for the social media platforms to play here. Yes, they're just the platforms. No, we don't want them to be arbiters of truth. We don't want them to be the gatekeepers of information, decide what is fact and what is fiction. But I think the reality is that they have provided the uh, exploitation mechanisms that bad actors are very, very able to use with very few resources. And so we need to look much, much deeper beyond content. This is the big point I want to make. It's not just about the content. It's about how the algorithms in these platforms are prioritizing certain content over other content. And again, this is not just happening on Facebook or Twitter. It's happening on YouTube. And it's certainly happening on Google and other search engines. So if you were to do a search, which I did uh, very recently when uh, <clears throat> the Russian uh, ships entered the Azov Strait and took over three Ukrainian vessels. This was something that happened at the end of November. November, I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. If you did a search for the Kerch Strait in Google, your top five stories still to this day were RT and Sputnik. Why? This is the big question. So that signals to us that these companies should be required, potentially by legislative action, to be much more clear about how they use data and how they prioritize certain content over others. And so, for example, I would like to know um, how much is each of us worth to these companies? So each of us has a price tag attached to us because of advertising. So I might be worth a little less than my colleague here, mainly because he's a little older and he's a, a, a white man, and usually you make more money than a younger woman. And so you're probably worth not a lot. Necessary. So you're probably worth a lot more, <laughs> not necessarily, but usually worth a lot more to these social media companies. I would like to know my price tag. I think all of us would like to know um, how how much these companies are benefiting off of us. That's one potential uh, solution to look into. Uh, the GDPR, which of course is now in effect here, is also a version of us being considered in the United States. I think that's also a good first step to understanding this relationship between data use and how disinformation spreads online. Um, I think there are many more issues I could point to, many more solutions I could point to, but I'll save that for the conversation. Hmm. Uh your mentioning that awful example of an American group creating a false example of Russian, a, a Russian disinformation campaign in the Alabama election reminds me, remi should remind us all, je pas que ce soit, that the temptation of evil is in front of every person. It's uh, not with, I spent many years in Poland and it uh, is uh, one of its consequences. I learned this from the Polish opposition. Solidarity opposition. I was taught a lesson that we can fight them, but we cannot do it their way. To fight them. And yet, in this case, there were Americans who were becoming then. That would be Putin's ultimate victory, to turn us into them, or into him. We would be his creatures. Now, I realize, perhaps in my youth, I read too much of Leszek Kowakowski, but I can't help it. Like I say, I've spent uh, many years in Poland, and this is it. Act both within our traditions of freedom of expression, but also we must find ways to utterly discredit this kind of behavior, the behavior that Alina, was, was, that Alina mentioned. And I, it's hard to imagine laws doing it, but 
um, I hope that this example has become so scandalous and discredited that no one dares do it again. But it's worth remembering that there is a stupid, that there is a trap and a moral hazard. Now, we have, um, I think most, two of us, three of us, I think, are veterans of previous government experience. I, you know, I for a long time, Jakub, um, for the EU, and, and Boleslav, I think, in, the po in previous Polish governments. Um, Alina, not yet. But the Polish MSZ, in its wisdom, has created and maintained an office to combat disinformation and an office of cybersecurity, an office which occasionally, but I don't think currently, the US State Department has. We need it. Um, but what, is, what are the views from the MSZ, from the Polish administration, um, because you are actors in this space, Absolutely. and governments have a role. What's the role of government in general, or governments in general? What's the role of Poland in particular, and what should we Americans be doing? Since a put text, a theme of this conference is Polish-American cooperation. What's our role? And by the way, I've learned to listen to Polish adv advice over the years, it usually turns out well when we do when we Americans listen. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and uh, it is a great pleasure to be here among such prominent experts. Uh, let me try to to answer your questions. And uh, first, I would like to place this issue of disinformation and uh, hostile propaganda uh, influencing uh, in a in a more broader security policy or national security perspective. Uh, I think uh, what we experience right now is uh, something that uh, can be described as a kind of ongoing uh, confrontation or conflict between, uh, on one hand, authoritarian uh, uh, states, countries trying to uh, impose certain uh, 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 version of uh, international order. On the other hand, uh, our countries, countries that are uh, very much uh, uh, determined to protect democratic values, uh, civil uh, liberties, and also uh, uh, those values that uh, are related to the freedom of, of uh, expression. And here, um, I think uh, we should uh, see it uh, uh, in uh, this uh, global perspective that uh, uh, our democracy and rules-based uh, international order are increasingly being challenged uh, by this uh, alternative uh, version uh, of international order. Uh, this is why our democratic societies and uh, institutions uh, should uh, be protected against uh, this uh, foreign uh, influencing, foreign uh, interference. And uh, because uh, actually those democratic uh, structures, democratic processes are very essential to, to our identity. Uh, so at um, the same time, uh, we should acknowledge that uh, those um, described as malicious, uh, 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 cyber-enabled, especially influence operations, they constitute a kind of uh, daily reality uh, of the 21st century. It's enough to remind you the uh, uh, quite uh, recent examples of uh, Russian aggression, first against uh, Georgia in 2008, before that against Estonia 2007, and recently uh, against uh, Ukraine. And uh, especially the case of Ukraine illustrates very well the phenomenon that uh, can be described as, as uh, hybrid warfare. Uh, hybrid warfare uh, is not something uh, entirely new. I mean, uh, if we uh, take into account you know, the, the, the history uh, so we see 
many examples of uh, this kind of combination of uh, non-traditional and, and conventional means. They were methods usually linked with, uh, again, propaganda, deception, um, intimidation, sabotage. Uh, but what is new about uh, uh, these uh, tactics uh, is uh, currently their speed, uh, scale and intensity. And actually, it was facilitated by rapid technological development and uh, unprecedented also uh, level of uh, uh, interconnectivity that uh, we achieved. So from the perspective of our adversary, uh, our core values and uh, our achievements are very often perceived as our main vulnerabilities. Uh, that uh, our adversary, in this case obviously Russia, is trying to, to exploit. And uh, it's, it's not enough uh, actually to uh, make, uh, uh, to describe uh, the, the current situation. I think uh, uh, we should do more in order to address uh, those threats because uh, uh, what we experience, especially in this part of Europe, is a kind of ongoing uh, uh, hostile campaign uh, uh, trying to undermine the uh, functioning of our institutions, but also, if primary, I think primary, trying to undermine the trust and confidence of our societies in uh, uh, functioning uh, and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, well design of our, our democratic uh, institutions. Uh, so uh, this uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine very often uh, related to those uh, famous uh, green men in Crimea uh, became a kind of uh, wake-up call f for many countries, uh, but uh, also for some international institutions uh, of our Western uh, world. And uh, I think it's worth to mention that uh, there was certain evolution that we experienced, uh, especially in case of, of uh, NATO, but also uh, in European Union. So uh, uh, in case of NATO, uh, those issues were uh, quite uh, immediately tackled uh, during uh, first uh, summit uh, after Russian aggression in Wales. Uh, then uh, it, was, it was further developed during Warsaw Summit in 2016. So NATO uh, created, adopted entire strategy how to address, how to counter uh, hybrid threats, including those that uh, were related to disinformation and, and propaganda. So uh, there were three elements. First, prepare. Secondly, deter and third, uh, defend. And uh, in practical terms, uh, NATO reacted through uh, uh, organizing uh, different tools, uh, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, NATO Center of Excellence uh, on Strategic Communication in Riga, a uh, very important institution uh, actually in monitoring uh, uh, in, and, and uh, uh, countering uh, Russian propaganda. Uh, also, NATO created uh, in the NATO headquarter something that is uh, called hybrid uh, analysis branch, which, is, uh, which helps uh, to improve situational awareness, because uh, this is again something that is not, let's say, equally distributed among uh, NATO members. Uh, we have also just recently, during uh, Brussels summit uh, this uh, last year, um, adopted very new concept, uh, namely of um, uh, counter hybrid support teams. So uh, those teams will be uh, ready to assist member states uh, upon uh, their requests. So there are already south sig quite significant decisions taken in in. Uh, the direction how to counter those uh, hybrid uh, uh, tactics. Uh, on the EU side, I think it's uh, 
uh, I will also only focus on the recent development. It was already mentioned, uh, this uh, action plan on disinformation. And uh, uh, it was a kind of a product of, of uh, quite long deliberations. Uh, countries like Poland uh, uh, are not maybe fully satisfied with the, with the outcome but uh, we have to implement uh, those measures as, as quickly as possible in order to uh, uh, especially protect European elections in May against uh, foreign interference. And there are, there are actually four elements of, of this uh, uh, EU action plan, uh, improved detection, coordinated response, uh, uh, cooperation with online platforms and, and also uh, raising awareness. But I will just mention two, two elements here. Um, in case of uh, coordinated response, uh, uh, there are uh, plans to organize uh, something that is called uh, rapid alert system uh, in the European Union that will uh, help both EU institutions and member states uh, to facilitate both data sharing and uh, to provide uh, some alerts uh, on uh, ongoing disinformation operations campaign. Uh, and second, uh, this cooperation with online platforms is a kind of uh, continuation of the uh, code of practice uh, adopted uh, in, in October by, uh, by the industry with main uh, actually internet uh, platforms like Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google, uh, and uh, uh, there is very uh, uh, strong commitment on their side to work together with the, with the uh, governments, with the EU institutions in order to, uh, for example, uh, eliminate uh, fake accounts, limit the uh, 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 damage uh, by the uh, bot networks <coughs> and social media, also improve the transparency of uh, political advertising, something that uh, was uh, quite a tricky issue uh, and, and still is. Uh, and there is also interesting uh, new obligation to produce uh, monthly regular reports uh, about the uh, situation uh, with regard to disinformation. Third element, uh, cooperation between uh, NATO and EU. And here again, during the NATO summit in Warsaw in 2016, two organizations adopted a kind of joint framework for cooperation. And a big part of this document is devoted actually to the cooperation in the field of uh, uh, countering uh, hybrid threats, countering uh, disinformation, countering uh, uh, cyber threats. Uh, this Cooperation is gradually, uh, 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 I think, moving forward. Uh, we would like to see maybe a better pace and uh, a more productive uh, outcome. But uh, at least we managed to establish uh, uh, some uh, practical tools like uh, new uh, uh, center of excellence in Helsinki on countering hybrid threats. I, have the pleasure to be the member of the steering board of the center, uh, but actually those were countries from this region, from Nord Nordic countries and uh, Baltic states, uh, plus some uh, other countries that uh, implemented this idea and uh, the work of the center is a kind of practical example what can be done. So uh, I think uh, this is at least a kind of a beginning of the uh, institutional cooperation among uh, uh, states in this uh, uh, domain, but uh, uh, I will reserve also some way forward for the Q&A session. Thank you. So, <clears throat> the beginning of international practices to start coming to solutions. I agree with that. I think that's right, but I'm going to exercise the privilege of being moderator to ask really nasty questions. Okay, my first nasty question, and this is particularly Alina because she walked into it mentioning social media companies. 
I've heard it said by people I talk to in Washington that not only are the social media companies only pretending to be helpful, but in fact their entire business model is based on turning individuals into commodities and selling us, thereby doing for the Russian intelligence services their micro-targeting and that we have to blow up, I mean, this is, this is not actually my view, but we have to blow up the social media business model. Is that right? Can it be fixed? And more specifically, it's pretty clear that the social media companies are on the defensive. And they either want to do, they say they want to do the right thing, and maybe on some level they do want to do the right thing. At worst, we have a window where they are listening and have to be seen as listening. How do we take advantage of that? And is my dire, exaggerated, you know, assessment, which is not mine, but I've heard it, you've heard it too, in Washington, accurate? I mean, jump into that space. Fair enough. Um, I think we have to look at this a bit longitudinally, meaning what's happened over the last two years since the U.S. elections. Because I, at the beginning, it was very obvious that the social media firms were uh, in a state of denial, to put it lightly, and they were really just doing these superficial fixes, you know, uh, tweaking the algorithms, taking down some accounts, uh, shutting down uh, what they call in a, inauthentic, coordinated inauthentic activity. Um, I think the situation has changed since then. At least they have, they've had their, you know, as we say, come to Jesus moment, uh, where they realize that the pressure is not going to come off of them politically, and if they don't want to be regulated, they have to do a little bit more to to show some good faith. Um, and now I think we're in a space now where some companies are doing that. I actually think Twitter. Um, as opposed to Facebook, for example, has been very transparent. Um, they released uh, a lot of very detailed data to the Senate Intelligence Committee in a way that Facebook has not. And there's been massive investigative reporting now done by the New York Times to show that Facebook actively tried to cover up their previous and pre-existing knowledge of how the Russians were using their platforms. Why? Exactly because of what you said, uh, Ambassador Freed, that this is an existential question for them. You know, their business model is rooted in their ability to sell data, basically. They don't call it selling data, but giving access to our data to other companies so they can advertise. And this is what I meant when I said, you know, all of us have a dollar sign attached to us online. And we're tracked in multiple ways in our online activities. And there's, no co there's not a coincidence why you're getting advertisements for refrigerators if you look to a refrigerator on Amazon.com. So, I think we do have an opportunity here. I also tend to agree with you that you know, bringing down the regulation hammer, one, is not politically feasible in the United States because it's not the political culture in the United States, um, and two, will likely hamper these companies' abilities to function, which we don't want to do because they're huge American companies that have been driving a lot of economic growth um, in a very critical sector uh, for the U.S. economy. Um, I think what needs to happen now, though, is these companies have to come to the table with governments in a way that they have not wanted to do since the NSA scandals. We all remember that and the, and the Snowden um, revelations. Um, that kind of trust um, has, I think, been the, the main block to any sort of more voluntary coordination or cooperation with governments. And it, and to my view, though, it, these, these companies at some point will have to decide, are they going to be helpful or will they actually have to get you know, shut down to some extent? I don't think that shutdown will actually come from uh, regulation around data use in the, US, in the United States. I think they're going to face antitrust lawsuits very soon, and they're going to face state-level action in the United States, probably not federal-level action. Um, and I, I think they're completely unprepared for this. They're completely unprepared for uh, the state of Georgia to sue them over various data use uh, restrictions. Um, so far, though, 
I remain pretty skeptical that they're willing to do much about it, besides some very superficial fixes that we've seen so far. The EU, the politics of regulating social media companies is not good in Washington because they have so much power. However, the politics in Europe is different. If the Americans and the Europeans could come up with a policy consensus, the relative leverage of the United States and the European Union, and I have in mind particularly the European Union under the influence of the member states who are most aware of the problem, and yeah, I'm looking at the MSZ here, but you know, I, I am grateful, by the way, to Poland's role in the organization of US and EU sanctions on Russia after the Ukraine invasion. I mean, this was a textbook case of how we work together well and get good results. So here's a, but here's a har an even harder question for anybody in the panel who thinks they can give an answer. And I'm not sure what the answer is myself. Look, I, I, I'm the oldest person up here by a lot, and so therefore the least qualified to talk about um, the digital space. But I can imagine technical solutions to help root out bots, particularly, Ru well, Russian bots. I can imagine a regulatory environment which gets at advertisements. It's well established, it's legal. Advertisements are subject to regulation in a way that ordinary speech is not. So I can imagine bots and ads being pruned or, or purged from the system. But how do you deal with the problem of organic content? Of someone who is pretending to be Billy Boy Johnson in Oklahoma, who is actually, you know, working out of the IRA, the, the, the troll farm in St. Petersburg. How do you do, how do you get at those people without cutting down, cutting at um, freedom of expression, which we don't want to do? You know, how do we fight them without becoming them? And I can, I can see a solution for bots, I can see a solution for ads, maybe that's 20% each. I know, and worth it, but the Russians are going to go where <coughs> we're not. How do you deal with impersonators, which are interacting with, you know, Poles and Spaniards and Americans who are acting on an honest, if deceived, basis? What do we do? Yeah. I don't know whether I can answer the question, but I'm sure I can make it more complicated, and I'd like to do that because. As your ambassador mentioned earlier, they are using pre-existing corridors of democracy. So in a way, they are walking the same paths, path of free speech, for instance, for malicious intent. And I think it's, uh, well, it's the reality uh, even kicked it up a notch. And it's even more difficult to combat this because of, because of due to technology changes, the very nature of communication changed. So when we are talking about old school active measures in the 80s, there were active measures working group in the US, so you actually invented the party, and then you left it. Uh, and they were, what they were doing, they were actually looking at outlets, broadcasters and so on, and identifying active measures, disinformation and so on, because the communication process in mass media was from the broadcaster to homes, basically, right? So there was an uh, example was that, you know, somebody read a story and shared the story on the party. Right now, a lot of this communication and what you mentioned is not so easy to detect by old means. It's under the radar because it's not vertical, but it's horizontal. So it spreads in a social media in a way that it's, it's unprecedented in history, in my opinion. And it really calls for the, uh, for the new tools that we have to, I believe, invent. And I believe that technology, in a way, is on our side. Because a lot, a lot of that, if you have an algorithm that is doing something, you can surely, uh, first of all, there is a whole bunch of, uh, of work doing on the how to fool machine learning and so on. And on the other hand, you can, you can try to uh, create algorithms that, that will um, uh, fight it. But regarding the, you know, what, what you mentioned, the regulating uh, uh, social media, 
Well, it's a, it's a wicked problem because right now in the US you have certain groups from the varied variety of places for when it comes to political spectrum that, uh, that are already claiming that they are being censored by Facebook. There is a research show that shows that the Google searches are not unbiased when it comes to political posture. So it's already a very delicate question. And I think we have to we have to hit the ball and attack, as Jakub said, we have to, f we have to think about the author, uh, not about buying ourselves uh, uh, bullet vests. It's okay, and we need to do that, but we cannot play whack-a-mole, because playing whack-a-mole, in, in, even in theory, the best result is a draw, and we'll never get a draw. We have to, we have to actually, I think we have to disrupt the process, we have to x-ray their operations, and we have to name them. So, just like General Alexander said today, Russian hackers. Well, he said FSB. Well, but we say Russian hackers. And often it's, it's getting better, I agree, but often we, we were even, some politicians were hesitant to link those Russian hackers to the Russian government. Right now it's, 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 uh, it's getting better. And I think it's, uh, when it comes to Russia, it's, I know it's, it's, it's not optimistic, but we have to press where it hurts. And if you were, if you were about to ask Russia whether, you know, West is attacking Russia, I, ask, I guarantee you the answer is yes. All of soft power, all of positive gravity, all of this pulling in terms of culture for them, it's attack. And like you mentioned in your, in your paper recently, it's exactly this, that they see different spectrum of war, not in a zero-one scheme, but in a scale. And, and I think it's, we cannot hurt them, or not so much, in an information domain. I think we have to press where it hurts, uh, but I honestly, uh, in European Union, I, I, don't, I don't see many of the political will and, and unity when it comes to, uh, for example, you know, taking them, taking, giving answers to those threats on different domains, in different realms. For instance, in business, in London, or in Nord Stream 2, or Nord Stream 2, with Germany. That's where it hurts, but we, we are not able to attach those kinds of resp responsibilities. That's why I think uh, when they think about what they've done, they are calculati calculating, and I don't, think that they are, I don't think that in their minds they are losing. Well, I look forward to a hypothetical future Atlantic Council discussion of a 21st century combined transatlantic policy toward Russian aggression. That strikes me as a fruitful discussion, and I look forward to having it, especially in Warsaw. Um, Alina, yes, did if I, yeah. thank Just you. Uh, bad comment, but I will let the ambassador go. You can go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think, privately, I, I believe that uh, public authorities uh, uh, do have a duty to to protect citizens against those activities that. Uh, 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 aim, are aimed at, at deliberately manipulating their views and, and, and covertly influencing their choices, their political choices. Uh, so uh, I think this is uh, not something that uh, we can, uh, uh, where, where we can abdicate as, as governments. Uh, at the same time, we can ap apply uh, different approaches here. One is, uh, let's say, soft approach uh, to encourage some kind of uh, self-regulation, um, like uh, code of practices, uh, and to inspire better cooperation of the industry with the governments. Not necessarily impose immediately some uh, strict regulations, but to show the benefits of uh, increased transparency with regard to the algorithms that are being used, uh, with regard to, uh, as I said, uh, financing of uh, political advertisements, also cooperation with civil society like fact-checkers, 
uh, uh, like uh, so-called myth busters. Yes, uh, uh, and so here I think there is a great responsibility of the industry uh, to protect actually this kind of uh, Western approach to uh, uh, to internet, to, to uh, freedom of expression, because this is where their interests are primarily located. Yes, because this is the precondition for their functioning. And so uh, I think that here uh, we also have to keep in mind the uh, actually uh, uh, necessity to strike a balance between uh, to what extent we want to uh, regulate uh, this domain uh, and, and to not to limit too much the, the freedom of expression because uh, those uh, social media became uh, because of the level of penetration, it was mentioned, uh, Facebook uh, became a kind of public utility. Yes, they became a kind of modern agora to express views, to conduct debates. So, uh, uh, with this kind of essential roles comes also higher level of responsibility of those who provide those services. I just wanted to play devil's advocate for a second since we don't have uh, tech industry represented here. Um, and I do think that that's part of the problem in some ways. We're talking about building trust and uh, public-private partnerships and relationships is that uh, we often don't see, for whatever reason, uh, uh, tech industry uh, represented in, the, in these kinds of panels. I think we should be vigilant of, of having more of that kind of uh, conversation. But I think if they were represented, and if I could take on that role, I think what they would say to your question specifically about uh, bots uh, and impersonators is, look, you know, bots, we're taking them down already. You know, Twitter uh, you know, does something like uh, over nine, has done over nine million, has taken down over nine million accounts um, in the second half of 2018. Um, you, Facebook is constantly taking down, they would say, uh, networks that they discover they're putting out inauthentic, coordinated content, which is disinformation campaigns. So they say, we're, we're doing all these things. But you have to remember scalability, right? The, we have billions and billions and billions of posts, uh, of co pieces of content being shared by real people every single day. Um, in many different languages across the world, uh, we can't, there's only so much we can do. And in fact, your concern, the Russian concern, is 0.0001% of our overall content. And so it's relatively minuscule. And we're already doing a lot about it. And second of all, you know, we shouldn't be the arbiters of truth. Right? Because we shouldn't be policing free speech online in any way. And when it comes to impersonation accounts, uh, what about satirical accounts, right? Not all impersonator accounts are bad. Like there's, a fa there's a wonderful Twitter account that I follow that's a fake Putin account um, that is hilarious and very useful for kind of showing the hypocrisy of the Russian state. Um, so what do we do with those, right? So I think there are answers to that, but I think we, need, we do need to understand that these companies uh, do have some real concerns um, and aren't always able to address uh, the issues that we're asking them to address uh, because of their own limitations. Uh, so I will just put that out there. And, and that's, that's why I actually think <clears throat> that having a look at the person who is organizing the disinformation campaign, uh, the one who is actually using these tools, might really help. You know, that, okay, there are billions and billions of posts. How many of these posts are actually related to a disinformation campaign aimed at manipulating particular election. So please, dear Facebook, don't tell me that you have uh, several manipulated elections every day. No, you don't. So please focus on, on, on what is important. Uh, and but it's mostly organic actors. So what do you do about and, someone yeah, who has this a is, is right-wing ideology no, this, and wants to This is, this is what I wanted to talk about as well. Uh, it was actually your question, well, how, how can we uh, prevent that we will have domestic actors sharing disinformation. And I'm actually not sure that this question is uh, so important. Uh, 
a member of my family, he's a devoted consumer of disinformation-oriented outlets. Uh, he was uh, deeply persuaded I was working for the CIA already in Brussels. Uh, now that I'm working for the Atlantic Council, I, I probably work double for CIA. And uh, <laughs> um, This person used to believe in the 80s that there is a black ambulance car kidnapping kids and selling them for organs uh, in, in Western countries. By the way, it was also a KGB planted disinformation uh, started, I believe, in South America somewhere yeah. in the 60s. That, that's uh, the common trade. They started in the third world and then they in, imported to the euro, common trade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, but back then, uh, these people couldn't really be organized into one mass that would uh, behaved in the desired way, you know. So he could believe his black ambulance conspiracy. Maybe he would be afraid of the evil Westerners. Probably that was the aim of it. Uh, but he was not driven towards some goal, as, as we see it really today. What we see today is that these fringe people, and they are coming from all parts of society. There is a brilliant research by Kate Starbert from the University of Washington, who was, uh, who was tracking how the disinformation about white helmets was being spread. And she found that it was aggressively ultra-leftist websites and also ultra-rightist websites. It was, uh, it was websites promoting uh, Judaism and it was brutally anti-Semitic websites. The only thing they had in common was uh, spreading lies about white helmets in Syria and being pro-Kremlin. <laughs> they are really good in engaging various parts of the society. They are giving them the purpose, they are giving them the direction. Once we cut that out, yes, we will still have some lunatics who believe lies, but they won't have that one direction. They won't have the purpose. You know, these people will believe the black ambulance, but they will not be persuaded that if you believe black ambulance, don't trust your national media, uh, don't trust your government, and uh, vote for far-right extremists who wants to blow everything up. So, we have made the problem sufficiently complicated. Hopefully, we've stopped short of making it absolutely hopeless, but we are overdue in opening up um, the floor to questions. Um, what have we said that's wrong? What have we missed? Views, anything. Yes, sir. And could you identify yourself if you want? Hi, uh, Bruce Schneier, I spoke earlier. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll make it absolutely hopeless. Because I think we, we, we almost got there. Because really the solution depends on what the problem is. Right? If the problem is Russia, then how do you deal with the fact that now everyone else is doing it? I think the lesson from uh, 2016 is not that you can run an influence campaign on Facebook, is that I can afford to do it myself. Mm -hmm. So now we have all the actors. If the problem is propaganda, then that's advertising. Right? As Elena pointed out, if uh, Nike did this exact thing, they'd get a, an award for their effective advertising. If the problem is bots, then we have to worry about trolls. If the problem is surveillance capitalism, I think that's your extreme example, well, that's not going to be fixed because of the enormous wealth generation, I think Elena pointed out as well, uh, of this industry. So now, now, what is the problem? Is the problem untruth? Then we're censoring. Is the problem democracy, then we are becoming them to, to beat them. And I, I've been circling around this for a couple of years, and I can't find a solution that is less harmful than the problem. And that worries me. Because maybe, because maybe the issue is that democratic free societies are inherently vulnerable to this sort of thing in a way that autocracies are not. And if that's the case, perhaps the technological and political environment that allowed democracies to flourish is waning. Okay, so now we're all hopeless. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to try an answer because I lived, in fact, I suspect you remember as I do, the 1970s when we were... I was a little kid, but yes. Yeah, I was <laughs> not a little kid. Um, and the prevailing opinion in the West was that we were doomed because democracies were soft, messy, easily manipulated by the clever uh, active measures of the Soviet Union. The Soviets were monstrous, but they were efficient and they would win. I mean, this view lasted right through the Carter administration, sort of from the Vietnam era in the United States up till Reagan, who basically said, ah, no. 
So this is how I answer your, um, your challenge, and I'm, not sure, and I'm pretty sure I don't have it right, but this is my, my, uh, my attempt. First, it's Jakob's 20% rule. Don't knock partial, imperfect solutions. So bots, advertisements. We have technical solutions we can do. We, we, can, we can manage that. Secondly, the problem isn't disinformation or false news everywhere, because that gets us into freedom of speech. The problem is particular Russia and other governments who are using disinformation. And foreigners don't have, we have demonstrated in the United States that the First Amendment uh, does not apply in full to foreigners, at least it, it requires them to be identified as such. There is a greater space. Secondly, we learned from the Cold War that over time, social resilience and resistance to commie pro communist propaganda, commie propaganda, as we used to call it in the States, can grow over time. And that uh, in the 1930s, the Stalinists had pretty much free reign of all of the American left and could manipulate it. By the 1980s, uh, not so much. I am convinced that there, there are ways in which social resilience can reduce the space without sacrificing our values. And finally, is another thing Jakob said, yeah, let's target the bad guys. You know, I used to do sanctions, and I, you know, that was, as I said, we, we in the polls got, and, and the, some of the sympa more sympathetic European member states uh, did pretty good work in this space. So I can't believe it's impossible, but as I said in the beginning, I'm the guy who believes that the cracked glass which is falling apart can be fixed, right? Um, but hard. Uh, look, it, others. Dan, can I just follow up on that? I think before we fall into doom and gloom, we do need to have a little bit more perspective, which is, I think, where you're pointing to looking back. But even looking forward, you know, we have undergone in the last decade a massive revolution in our communication space. The digital revolution is not something that we can fully grasp the implications and consequences of because it's not over. It's still going on, meaning as we're talking about disinformation campaigns from Russia, what we should be already talking about is AI-enabled uh, disinformation from all actors that looks very, very real, this phenomenon of deep fakes. We haven't had a chance to go into it, but just looking forward, this is what's coming. And it's a generational question of resilience. It's not a 20-minute solution. We have some 20-minute solutions um, that, you, that we're talking about here, the technical fixes, some regulatory fixes. But in the long term, it is going to be about you know, 30, 40, 50 years until we fully adjust as a society, until we build the rules, the institutions that we need to actually have this kind of robust societal resilience and to change some of our norms and practices. I, I, that's what actually gives me hope, because right now I see us very much in a period of trial and error, where we're chipping away at the problem in very, very tiny, tiny pieces. But over time, this in the aggregate will add up to a potential and hopefully long-lasting uh, sustainable resilience to these kinds of practices. Alina, you've, despite your, your having been born in Ukraine, you've become positively American in your optimism. I welcome it. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to mention one existential difference because we can say that this information is and propaganda by the way this information propaganda two different things uh, are used in advertising uh, to sell sneakers and that's true because as we mentioned already it's a tool but Nike as, well, as I gather it does not want to create chaos by playing uh, Adidas fans against Nike fans to lower social capital, to lower mutual trust, to distort common goods, and so on. So this is a huge difference. And secondly, this information is just a, one of the tools of the state actor. So, so it's uh, so only even though we might say that everybody is using this even in daily life, only a couple of state actors has 
a tremendous potential to be disruptive and we have to worry about them and you know cry over uh, the fallings of the human nature later but it's not so daunting task and I think we we really can do this as, as you mentioned it, it I think that uh, in the 60s we, we were in the much worse situation let me tell you a simple story in West Germany there were tactical missiles of US Army and uh, Soviets came up with the story that Soviets will attack Germany and a lot of dust will go into the atmosphere and it will create uh, a winter, an everlasting winter and everybody will die because of the cold. And this is disinformation, okay? And the other means they managed to pull from their houses good willing good citizens of West Germany in front of US bases demanding to withdraw US forces so you see the difference between selling a product and moving the society in the direction that you want to move using as you mentioned pre-existent social uh, problems and that's why active measures and disinformation campaign differs when you look at active measures in Poland and in Czech Republic even though it, we are neighbors it looks uh, different so I would say that uh, it's not so bad in a way that, but we, we, we really should, I, I, I know that uh, you, can, you, can, you can say a lot about that, but we, we should really appreciate how much NGO sector is doing, but we should really put a lot of emphasis when it comes to government responsibility in a covert realm in a covert realm when I believe US intelligence community is doing that is doing is going after the after the process against the process against the infrastructure against certain people so be on the offensive side instead of once again buying uh, bulletproof vest and I think this is one of the one of the bricks that may create this wall yes uh, thank you it's extremely important uh, question but uh, I think that we are not so powerless, actually, vis-à-vis -vis those, uh, those threats and, and this pace of changes. I think there's always something that can be done, both uh, domestically and in a kind of coordinated uh, way. I think domestically we should uh, put more emphasis definitely on uh, education, media literacy, uh, quality journalism, support quality journalism, uh, educate especially younger generation. So uh, this is where I think uh, we lost uh, a, a lot of time. So uh, I think I, I, I've heard this comparison, uh, you know, to, uh, that uh, it should be a kind of driving license. Uh, so we should prepare consumers of social media, uh, raise awareness and, and uh, learn them some kind of uh, internet hygiene, uh, how to avoid certain risks, but also to learn them critical thinking, to make the distinction between uh, manipulation, disinformation and, and uh, uh, real uh, uh, news, real information. Secondly, I think we should be more proactive, not only reactive. And here I think uh, it would be probably quite effective if we devote more attention to our uh, uh, actions on, in the Russian-speaking infosphere. So there were some attempts, there are ongoing uh, attempts in order to support independent Russian-speaking uh, uh, websites, uh, platforms, uh, 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 media. Uh, they are not so uh, well financed, they are not so well staffed, but for example Poland together with UK, we are running uh, a very effective program together with some NGOs in, in this respect, uh, NGOs for example from, from Latvia. So. Uh, if we are not able to uh, have uh, full protection of our own territory, let's try to transfer some activities on the territory of our uh, adversary and, and confront this, uh, uh, those uh, operations conducted by Russia on their own uh, field, playground. Third, 
international cooperation and coordination. Here I think everybody agrees that uh, because of the scale of this uh, threat, of this challenge, it, it's truly existential threat for the unity of the West. Yes, if they manage to alter the outcome of elections and that will produce pro-Russian government in one of the NATO countries, so they will achieve actually the, the goal, yes? But the consequences for our ability to, to respond to the future Russian actions will be very, very uh, limited. So I think we, we, we must be able also to protect uh, the unity and the ability to take uh, appropriate decisions within our Western institutions. So there are also some attempts. So one of the goals of this, uh, those operations is to spread some division among members of NATO, among members of the EU, or, for example, to uh, exploit some uh, uh, historical issues in relations between Poland and Ukraine, for example, very well known, well orchestrated, well prepared. They invested a lot of energy and, and money in those uh, attempts. So uh, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this should be our kind of strategic goal. And in order to also be effective, I think uh, uh, we must be able to, to also jointly develop some mechanisms, some processes for attribution of those, uh, of those uh, activities. So not only cyber uh, uh, attribution, but also uh, those uh, activities uh, conducted uh, in the infosphere. Um, and also to be able to uh, respond as appropriate. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, sanctions. I think the U United States uh, paved the way uh, right now, in the European Union, we prepare a specifically dedicated uh, EU sanctions mechanism in response to cyber attacks. It, is, it was inspired by the uh, Russian uh, uh, attempt to uh, penetrate uh, uh, OPCW uh, in, in, in The Hague. Uh, uh, it was also kind of uh, a response to the uh, attribution of uh, APT-28 to Russian military intelligence services. So the, the, the process of uh, reflection is ongoing and I hope that uh, it will equip us in the European Union with some at least limited tools to, to respond. And I would also be uh, very much in favor of a more coordinated NATO approach with regards to how do we collectively, if necessary, publicly attribute those actions and how do we coordinate our responses. There is still some place, space for improvement with regard to the information sharing about uh, those activities, sharing also best practices, how to respond to them. For example, in Poland, we, uh, uh, before the last local elections, uh, we uh, started uh, a website uh, for uh, our voters, how to make them aware of potential risks during the electoral campaign of, of disinformation, manipulation. And uh, I think we, we should be also able to, to support jointly, collectively, as, as uh, Western institutions, uh, those democracies like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, that are more vulnerable, more exposed to those Russian activities. So uh, there are plenty of uh, ongoing projects, but uh, uh, we have to do, have to do more uh, in order also to uh, uh, deter potential um, uh, operations uh, against uh, uh, our countries. So a kind of extended deterrence in the, in the disinformation field. The, now, I have failed in my duty as moderator because we are just about out of time and there was only one question from the audience, so I am sorry. Uh, on the good side, I would say... 
we are on the way to solve this difficult situation, but and we are not at the very beginning. Not at the very beginning. So I'll take that as progress. Um, but I want to thank um, my colleagues. I found, you know, I am glad to hear that there is consensus, at least that we are not, we are neither hopeless, helpless, nor do we have to violate our basic principles in order to fix the problem. And a final thought, with respect to information, I had the honor of working with Jan Novak Zerainsky. And this, in the early days of the Cold War, the United States did a lot of dumb things, but the best single thing we did was set up RFERL and then give it to the right people instead of trying to run it ourselves. Jan Novak Zerainsky was a demonstration of the power over time of freedom and remaining true to our values. It worked. And that is, let that be, I hope that is an inspiration to the next generation dealing with the current problems coming from Moscow. Anyway, my thanks to my colleagues on the panel. Sorry that there weren't time, but it seemed to, for more questions, but things seemed to fly by. Thank you. Thank you.